In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, let me first start by saying, Fronia uh, Pola to you all. Uh, a blessed beginning to the uh, new ecclesiastical year, which is to say that uh, our calendar resets itself. It actually reset itself back on Friday, but I know that uh, many of you weren't able to make it for our Ayyajmo service. Um, and uh, we also heard at that same service a, a beautiful greeting uh, from our patriarch Bartholomew at the uh, indiction of this new ecclesial year. Uh, the Ayyajmo from that service is available here uh, at this table uh, to my left, your right. Um, but uh, this is an interesting occasion that happens because I think for us as Orthodox Christians, it gives us yet another opportunity to kind of identify that uh, we're to kind of set ourselves apart from the rest of the world, right? The rest of the world, which is on uh, a very Western calendar that begins uh, in January, is already well into their New Year's cycle, right? Almost eight months uh, working on nine now into their new cycle. However, we, uh, as Orthodox Christians, as good church goers, uh, begin our new cycle, our new liturgical cycle, starting last Friday. So we're really only two days into it. It's very fresh for us, this new ecclesial year. And so yet again, I greet you, Chronia Pola, a blessed year. May the Lord's prosperity uh, and presence be clear to each and every one of us in our households and in our lives. And so then we have today's gospel reading, which, you know, the first gospel reading uh, of every new ecclesial year is always a little bit of a toss-up. The first Sunday gospel reading, I should say, is always a little bit of a toss-up because really um, we're not sure exactly what Sunday it's going to land on. Um, we know that the Sunday to come will be the Sunday before the Holy Cross, and the Sunday to follow will be the Sunday after the Holy Cross, unless the Feast of the Holy Cross actually falls on one of those Sundays. But the first Sunday of the new ecclesial year always ends up kind of being a different gospel, and so it becomes for us uh, as clergy, I think, a little bit of a joy, a little bit exciting to find out what uh, gospel we're going to be reading from and how it is that we can look at that gospel in light of and in view of uh, a new year, right? And so we have this really interesting gospel and it's a, it's a parable that I think is a lot of times, um, let's just say it's not looked at enough. Right? A lot of times we hear this gospel, we think we know, we think we understand what it is that's being said within that gospel, and we just kind of move on. We know that this parable today, the parable of the, uh, the vineyard and the poor tenants, the bad tenants, the wicked tenants oftentimes as they're referred to, um, is uh, specifically coming to us within the time frame of Christ's life, uh, really just moments, uh, just, just a few months, I believe, before his crucifixion, okay? And so the audience that he's addressing here uh, is specifically the, uh, the, 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 the clergy, the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who are in the ruling classes um, of the Israelites of the time which I think, you know, we have a pretty good idea if we've even gone one round of a liturgical year about how it is that our Lord probably feels about this group of people. Uh, and this parable in particular comes specifically directed towards them, basically saying at the end of the parable, and again, for those who weren't here to hear it, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, uh, essentially calling that group of people, right, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ruling classes, if you will, of the Judaic people of Christ's time, wicked servants. And what do we find out about the wicked servants is that they're responsible 
for casting out the cornerstone of the faith. And that because they're responsible for casting out the cornerstone of the faith, what happens to them? They're kicked out of the vineyard. And so he's essentially telling these people, um, you're going to be the ones who are responsible for the attempted demise of our Lord's vineyard. And when our Lord recognizes that that attempt has been made, you're out of here. So in other words, this is really your last chance. Before I go to the cross, this is your last chance to repent of your evil and wicked ways, turn back towards the true and proper practice, and recognize that we have had some missteps along the way. And those missteps, I think, are recognized through the analogy here that's made with the uh, individuals who came before Christ, right? Those uh, workers of the Lord who came as representatives, seeking what? Seeking to take those good fruits that had been gathered from the people's time, the tenants' time in the vineyard, right? And when we look at that, we understand that those individuals who came to collect, right, those were the prophets, right? These are the prophets of the Old Testament. Many of them really were not well received, which again, goes hand in hand with what we understand today's parable to be. Uh, and so in their not being well received, they are either killed, beaten, cast out, or seen as uh, individuals worthy of exile from that vineyard that the Lord has given them, even though those very servants were sent by the Lord who gave the vineyard, right? And so quite naturally this parable and speaking about the Lord sending or the uh, master of the vineyard sending his son that very son being killed crucified okay and uh, ultimately uh, reconciliation to take place after the son has been killed and so this kind of uh, framing again I think a lot of times we hear this parable and we think to ourselves oh yeah okay I get it yeah sure message received however there's some parts here that I wonder if we call to question. And, you know, one of those parts that I would like to bring forward today is just this idea of what takes place at the vineyard, right? Because what we hear is that there are servants that are being sent to collect the fruits of the vineyard, right? And so what we can say for sure is, number one, fruits are being produced despite the wickedness, crookedness um, of the tenants themselves, of those who are caring for the vineyard, right? And so those individuals who are caring for the vineyard cannot corrupt the fact that fruits are being produced, which this is something which, again, I don't know if we always look at, if we don't take a magnifying glass to our scripture sometimes and say, hold on, wait one second. It doesn't say that these wicked people are producing bad fruits. It doesn't even say that these wicked people are the ones who are actually producing the fruits. All that it says is that there are fruits that are being produced, right? There's produce, there's a product here, there's an end result here, and that end result is what? It's it's desirable. It's desirable to the master. It's a desirable to the householder, to the one who built and gave us the vineyard. And so these desirable fruits of this vineyard are really what the focus becomes of this entire parable. Because we see that it's these desirable fruits that were so good they were so amazing, they were so wonderful, they were so marvelous that even though the tenants knew that it's not their place, it's not their property, even though the tenants knew that these servants who were coming were coming directly from the owner of the property, they still wanted to claim those fruits for themselves. 
And so I don't know that this is as much about being selfish as it is about recognizing how good the product of this vineyard is. And so let's zoom out for a second and take this into consideration. Let's consider that this parable and the analogy of this parable, this vineyard, if it will be so called, is the world that we have been given. And when we think about these good and perfect fruits of this world, and what those good and perfect fruits might be. I think we can wholly identify them throughout the ages, throughout the history of time, that there are good and awesome and marvelous things, events that have taken place over the course of time within the lifespan of humanity as a whole, we as the tenants, as the would-be tenants, right, have received such great and good and marvelous things. Indeed, there are a bounty of good things here. And when we look over the course of time, we can easily identify sometimes what some of these things might be. When we consider even within our own locality, What might some of these good fruits be here within our little section of the vineyard in the United States of America? This abundance that we have, this tremendous wealth that we have. What a gift and what an incredible abundance it is. What an incredible product it is. And yet, when we take into consideration the amount of times that this good bounty, which many of us, at least within my generation, and certainly thereafter, have received quite freely simply by being born into it, I think sometimes we start to believe that either we deserve it, or that somehow It's owed to us. And when we get into this mentality of deserving and it being owed, and it not necessarily being as much a gift as it is just what is, then we start to maybe understand a little bit the mentality of the tenants from the story, from this parable. And we start to run into, immediately run into problems, don't we? Because there have been, over the course of history, even within the last hundred years, individuals who have come and said, or even groups who have come and said, this abundance, this abundance which you have been gifted with, it's meant for a purpose, it's meant for a cause. It's meant to be shared and it's meant to be accounted for. In other words, we need to call it what it is. This abundance is not here simply because I was born. This abundance preceded my birth. This abundance is not here simply because of the generation that came before me, nor the generation that came before them. Did they tend to that fruit? Absolutely. No one is taking that away from them. No one is denying that this vineyard remains to be a fruitful vineyard. That this vineyard remains to be one which is bountiful and blessed and good. However, it's the mentality of those who are caring for the vineyard, which again is the focus of the parable. And so when we really take this into consideration, What is being asked here from the parable itself is that we attribute that bounty to someone. That we attribute that bounty to be of an importance that is greater than ourselves. Of an importance that is greater than 
generations past, of an importance that is greater than even our own country. It's an importance that has been gifted to us by God. And if we begin in that place, if we're able to say this, everything that we have, everything that I have, everything that I am granted when I wake up, even the day itself being granted another day, a portion of all of that, a portion of all of that is intended to be committed to God because He gave it to us. And we're just tenants here who are renting it out. We're tenants who are in charge of caring for it. Can we use some modern nomenclature here and say that we're stewards? Right? And so this mentality of stewardship, which I know is something that we've talked about here and there every once in a while, and I know, don't turn me off yet, right? Don't, don't go into that place of saying, oh great, Father's going to ask everybody for money. No, that's not, that's not what we're doing. It's asking ourselves yet again, in this new ecclesial year, how can we, how can we be better stewards of what it is that we've been given? And again, we started out quite broadly, and now we've sort of narrowed in, and now we're going to narrow in even more. This parish, Prophet Elias, Greek Orthodox Church, situated here in Yonkers, New York, on the proper side of Westchester. I'm kidding. Every side is proper. Okay? This parish is a vineyard, isn't it? Is it a vineyard? Is there good fruit here? Absolutely. I think some of the best fruit here that we can possibly offer. And so the question becomes for us, as stewards of this parish, how are we, number one, attributing it to God? How are we allowing Him to be glorified through what it is that we do here because I know that sometimes we get into this mentality that oh well we come to service and we worship is that it is that all that we can do and again I'm asking this as a rhetorical I'm asking this as putting it out there as things to consider as we enter into this new ecclesial year how can we be better stewards how can we share some of these gifts how can we maybe even grow some of these gifts and even within our own individual lives. How can we take this tremendous blessing, this tremendous abundance that we have been given, even here within this parish, how can we take this and share it, attributing it all along the way to God and recognizing that nothing here Nothing here in this parish, nothing here in this country, nothing here on this earth is intended for the sole use of one person or one group of people in particular. And so, we have this tremendous bit of encouragement that we receive from today's gospel message. And that encouragement can probably best be encapsulated in as follows. The vineyard. The vineyard that we've been blessed with. The vineyard continues to grow. The vineyard grows silently of being tended to. Why? Because the vineyard comes from God. And if we're able to recognize those things that come from God and we're able to elevate them, to uplift them, to show them, not as ours, but as something that is coming to us from God, then that growth will remain completely and totally unobstructed. That growth will blossom. The growth will take place whether we're wicked servants or not. But if we want that growth to blossom, 
then we do what is opposite of being wicked. And we become righteous. We look towards righteousness as the premier of all of our pursuits in everything and anything that we do. There's more on this in today's epistle, which I'll read, leave for us all to study for ourselves today. But the reality is this. If we seek to be righteous servants in this God's vineyard, then what we will see is that we more easily attribute these fruits to Him and those fruits grow like we cannot even believe. Τη παραβολή του αμπελώνα ή των κακών γεωργών που διαβάσαμε σήμερα την είπε ο Χριστός στα Ιερουσόλυμα απευθυμνόμενος προς τους πνευματικούς ηγέτες του Ισραήλ λίγες μέρες πριν από το σταυρικό του παθός τότε που εκείνοι αμφισβήτησαν τη θεϊκή του εξουσία με τις δυνατές εικόνες της παραβολής αλλά και με λόγο παραστικό προβάλλεται η μεγαλειώδης αγάπη του Θεού για τον κόσμο που είναι δημιουργήμα του. Ο αμπελώνας του Θεού το μυστήριο της Εκκλησίας αυξάνεται πλέον σιωπηλά και αθορύβα και κάμια γυνή δύναμη. Εστώ και αν το εμποδίζει δεν μπορεί να το σταματήσει και το ματαιώσει. Αγαπητοί αδερφοί, ο Θεός συνεχίζει το έργο της σωτηρίας και ενεργεί κάθε φορά με δικούς τους τρόπους στον αμπελώνα Του. Είναι Εκείνος που στέτεκε πάντα μπροστά στις πύλες της ιστορίας του κόσμου και περιμένει να εισέλθει. Ιδού έστηκα επί την θύραν και κρούω. Εάν της ακούσει της φωνής μου και ανοίξει της θύραν, εισελέσουμε προς Αυτόν. Αρκεί εμείς, οι άνθρωποι, να Τον αφήσουμε και τότε θα μειώσουμε την παρουσία Του να γεμίζει τα πάντα. Του Κυρίου Δεϊθόμεν Ελέησον Κύριε Δεϊσον Κύριε Δεϊσον Πάτρα και Ευλογησον Ευλογία Κυρίου και Ελέος Αυτού Ελέη Εφημαστή Αυτού Διακάρη και Φιλάνθρωπια Πάντοτε νυν και αι και εις τους αιώνας των αιώνων Αμήν Glory to you, O God, our hope, O Lord, glory to you. May he who rose from the dead, Christ our true God, through the intercessions of his all-pure, all-immaculate Holy Mother, the power of the precious and life-giving cross, the protection of the honorable, bodiless powers of heaven, the supplications of the honorable, glorious prophet, the foreigner, John the Baptist, the holy, glorious, praiseworthy apostles, the holy, glorious, triumphant martyrs, of our righteous and God-bearing fathers, the holy, great prophet, Elias, of our father among the saints, John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, of the holy, righteous ancestors of God, your of the holy great higher martyr Anthemos, whose memory we celebrate today, and of all of the saints, have mercy on us and save us, for he is good and loves mankind. Through the prayers of our holy fathers and mothers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy upon us and save us. The blessing and protection of the Holy Trinity be upon each and every one of you, your household, and a new ecclesial year. Please be seated. Again, a uh, blessed feast of... Uh, 
the new ecclesial year to each and every one of you. We, of course, begin the new year uh, with our first feast. Anybody? Anybody? First feast day of the new year, September first feast day. Tiortajman, Tiortajman. What? That's it, that's it, that's it. Yanis is the right? The birth, the nativity of the Theotokos. Okay, uh, which, you know, and I'm going to try and do this, especially I'm going to try and commit to this, the camera as my witness, okay, um, in the coming new year, I really would like to try and offer at least one vigil, right, so one Agripnia every month, okay, so our first vigil that we're going to offer, the first Agripnia for the first month of September, okay, is going to be in honor and celebration of the nativity of our most holy mother, the Theotokos and Ever Virgin Mary. Okay, so this starts at 6 p.m. Okay, so it'll start at 6 p.m. on Thursday night, right, the 7th, right, because we go from the 7th into the 8th. Okay, so uh, Thursday night will start 6 p.m. with the Vespers, will be in Orthros by 7. And we'll be in the liturgy by 8, 8, 15, which means we'll be out of here by 9, 15 at the most. If the priest speaks too long, it'll probably be like 9, 30, okay? But I promise, the Agribnia is good for two things, askisis and to tire out the priest, okay? So, uh, odds are we'll be out of here by 9, 15 p.m., okay? So, if you haven't, I would encourage you to make as maybe one of the goals that you have and set before yourself within this new ecclesial year to attend um, the one of the Agribnias that we're going to offer this year, okay? Because for those who haven't attended, for those who haven't been able to attend for whatever reason, um, what I can tell you is that this fullness of the Orthodox Church in all that she is able to offer liturgically and we do it quickly here um, we, it doesn't last for six seven hours because we're a parish and we try and be conscientious of people's times um, so this is again the three major services that we offer all wrapped up into one so you'll start your fasting after lunch on Thursday and as long as, you know, you keep that fast from Thursday up until the Divine Liturgy, then you're good to go, okay? So it's a little bit more accessible also to the people who are working, which again, uh, working families, I know most of you are on vacation for Labor Day this weekend. Uh, however, I'm speaking directly to the camera and we'll see if we can repeat this message before the 7th, but the Agribnias are really for you, okay? Because we want to account for the fact that people work a nine to five and are not able to attend church on these major feast days. Okay, so we're trying to allow for the opportunity to continue to celebrate these great and major feast days of our sacred and holy church, while also affording them to the people who work a nine to five. Okay, so I thank you for that. Don't worry, we're going to celebrate uh, the elevation of the Holy Cross in the morning okay so if you miss the nativity or you're worried about this guy's gonna be celebrating vigils for the rest of the time that we're here it's not gonna be like that I'm trying to limit myself to one a month okay um, so with that being said next week that's the only additional opportunity for worship that we're going to make available in order to encourage people to come to it again it's the first major feast of the new ecclesial year if we're really wanting to put that good step forward, this is a good way to do it, okay? So uh, I hope that you'll join us here uh, at 6 p.m. Thursday night as we celebrate the vigil commemorating the nativity of the Theotokos. Other than that, I don't believe I have any additional commentary. No, right? Okay, we're all all right. Blessings of the Lord be with each and every one of you. Goodbye to our virtual.